Hey guys, this is Ron. So this is video 11 of our series on rediscovering the C programming language. In this video, we're going to talk about dynamic memory allocation. Dynamic memory allocation um, is what's going to allow us to uh, determine during runtime some of our memory requirements. Uh, so up to this point, we've created various variables. We've even created arrays and strings. Um, but all of those, you could determine their size, uh, you know, during compile time. And so the compiler is going to save those on the stack. And we've talked a little bit about the stack before, but essentially, um, as you call, you know, a function, a stack is established. All of those local variables are typically stored uh, on that stack. And then when that function returns, that stack is destroyed and control returns back to the calling function, which has its own stack. Now, all of the variables we've created, all of the arrays that we've created have happily fit on the stack and everything has worked just fine. And so for most of your variables, you know, storing them on the stack is, is going to be preferable. It's fast, it's quick, um, and it works quite well. There are times, however, when maybe you don't know during, uh, you know, when you write the program, how much memory you're going to need. And that may, may be because you're going to read in a file and your program could read in various files and you don't know ahead of time how large those files will be. Additionally, um, when we start talking about you know, data structures, again, you don't know uh, at compile time how large that data structure will be. So we'll see data structures like trees, we'll see data structures like linked lists, um, and so there may be uh, data that you're going to add to that list or data you're going to add into that tree that you can't determine uh, during compilation. And so you're going to have to allocate it while the program is running. So that throws a little bit of a wrench in because your compiler typically likes to know ahead of time uh, how it's going to arrange its stack, how big the stack is going to be, all of those you know kind of things. Additionally, there are restrictions on the size of the stack. So if I look at my system here, I have a modern uh, Ubuntu uh, 20.04 system. So this is a newer kernel, uh, all that kind of stuff. There's a directory called proc. And if I look in here, these are all uh, program IDs, right? So these are PIDs. And if I take one of these PIDs, um, let's say I'll uh, look in proc slash 420. There's all of these things that I can learn about that actual process. Well, one of them, one of the files in there is limits. So if I cat uh, proc 420 limits, what I'll see is there's a stack size in here, right? So max stack size. So for me, on my system, there's a soft limit of this number of bytes. And if we were to divide that out, I can take this number, since that's bytes, I can divide it by 1024, and I'll get 8192. And if I divide that again by 1024, I'll find out that this is eight. So this is uh, bytes. This whole thing is bytes. This is kilobytes, because there are 1,024 kilobytes in a byte, or 1,024 bytes in a kilobyte. And there are 1,024 kilobytes in a megabyte. So there is a restriction on my stack that it can only go up to eight megs. Now for a normal program, that's perfectly fine. We're, we're not going to have an issue with that size. But like I said, if you start reading in large files, if you start having a long running program that has to manage a lot of data, 
you might find that that eight megabytes is is too restricted it's too small so we can test that out we'll do a little program here and we'll just call it uh, stack.c found include and we'll bring in our stdo.h so that we can print we won't bring anything in well I take it back we'll take in int argc uh, char star star arg v right so we're gonna take some kind of command line argument and we'll say if argc is equal to two so they specified something on the command line um, so we always get the program name so that's the first one and then that next argument uh, is at least that second value so if we say that they're going to specify something we're just going to make the assumption that they're specifying a number and this is just so that I can kind of test this out and I'm going to use a2i even though in the previous video on strings I told you not to use a2i but it's easy to use in this instance um, and so that's what I'm going to do so I'm going to say there's an integer called n and I will say n is equal to a to i of arg v arg v 1 so this is the user specified a number on the command line I'm going to try to convert that into some type of integer and then I'm going to create an array and I'm going to make it that many integers wide I'm not going to initialize it I'm just going to print f uh, we'll say size percent ld and this will be size of array all right so go ahead and return zero And we'll write that now this is a bad idea this is a really bad idea right we're allowing the user to specify how many bytes uh, or how many integers they want in our array so we're just going to grow this array now just for a little bit of transparency in my make file I specified uh, in my flags standard C89. So essentially, um, if my understanding is correct, C89 is this is pretty much the same as C90, which is what we consider ANSI C. So this is an agreed upon standard for C. Now, if I try and make stack, uh, first off, it's going to complain because I did not include. standard lib which is required for a2i if memory serves me right if I go man a2i uh, yes so it says I have to use standard lib all right so that's in there did I write that I've now written it and then additionally it's gonna complain say hey ISO C94 bids variable length arrays now this is a warning so it still compiled it but it's already telling you this is a bad idea right and usually when it gives you these warnings we need to pay attention to them uh, additionally it doesn't uh, ANSI C doesn't like when you mix declarations in code so um, more than likely it's in one of these right probably that line there let's see line seven could be a part of this I don't know. either way it doesn't like it it likes you to specify all the variables up front and then start giving them values and it doesn't like you to build it so could be that it I'm um, specifying my array down here I don't know um, either way we're gonna go along with it because it's just a warning uh, and I want you to kind of see what this kind of looks like. So if I go stack, it shouldn't print anything out. It's waiting till I give it an argument. So if I give it stack of five, okay, we know an integer is four bytes. So five times four, it specified 20 bytes, which is totally acceptable 
for a stack size. But what happens if I specify 100? Okay, we're only at 400. Uh, 1,000, cool, we're only at 4K at this point, roughly, all right? And we can go all the way up to eight megs. So I give it three more zeros, and now we're starting to get to the point where it looks like we're pretty close to four megs, right? And so if I double this again, all of a sudden I have a segmentation fault, right? Um, and so more than likely, what happened here is I exceeded the size. Oh, I put 8,000. I wanted to go to 2,000, right? So this would have put us really close to that 8 meg mark. But if we went up to 3, that would have pushed us over that 8 meg mark and the program breaks, right? Because we have a soft limit of 8 megs on our stack. So again, if we're reading in large files, you know, we may have an issue if we we're trying to read that entire thing onto the stack. So what is the alternative? Um, obviously you shouldn't be doing, you know, dynamic arrays uh, on your stack uh, for one, but um, there are ways that we can basically ask the system during runtime to allocate some memory. And so it does that on a, on something called the heap. And so I've included a couple articles here. First off, uh, this stack overflow gives a description of when you might want to dynamically allocate. And it's the same reasons we talked about for you need more memory. Uh, you don't know during compile time how much memory you're going to need. Um, what we didn't talk about is between functions. We mentioned that each function builds a stack and that stack gets destroyed when that function returns. We even talked about in previous uh, videos that we can pass a pointer into that function so that when uh, data is saved at that pointer, or those values are saved, um, the main program still has access to them because all it did was pass the memory address that that function used and, and the actual values being stored in the previous uh, frame, right? So that's a possibility, but there are times where maybe I have a function that is setting up one of my data structures and this function, all it needs to do is allocate a node to kind of serve as the base for whatever structure, uh, data structure I'm gonna use. So it creates that node and passes it back to me. And then I pass that node into something else and it may add on to that node or, or whatever, right? So we want this memory to persist between function calls, right? And not until, you know, I decide it needs to go away, does it get cleaned up, right? So we have these functions, malloc, calloc, realloc, and free. And so this Geeks for Geeks article uh, talks a little bit about that. So again, uh, malloc, calloc, Free, alloc. These are the typical functions that we will see uh, when using dynamic memory allocation. And so they've got examples of what that looks like. So there's malloc, uh, and you'll choose a byte size, uh, so the number of bytes to allocate, and then they're assigning it back to some pointer. Now, you will see in certain cases um, they'll cast that memory as a, a certain type of pointer. So if this was an integer pointer, this would be like int star and then the malloc, right? Now, I still do this from time to time and I've definitely seen it in a lot of older code, but I know it's not typically necessary anymore, right? So you'll see it in there and a lot of programmers choose to use it, um, but the the uh, compiler does not require it anymore, right? Um, so you may or may not uh, decide whether you want to do that or not. The compiler already knows this is an int star pointer, and so it doesn't require this uh, casting. I, from my understanding, the reason that this is casted is because malloc returns a void star. So we've seen void star before when we were printing memory addresses 
uh, we wanted to print the memory address uh, that a pointer contained, uh, we were casting it as a void star because that uh, uh, percent %p that we we're using in printf expected to receive a void star. So malloc itself returns a void star. So if we look, we can do a man for malloc and we'll see that malloc uh, does return a void star. And so what they're essentially doing is casting this void star as whatever data type that pointer that they're receiving it in uh, requires. So if uh, in my case, if I had a pointer that was an int star, they're casting int star uh, for malloc so that it reinterprets this void star as an int star when it makes that assignment. Again, the compiler is perfectly happy to do it without it, um, but I believe it, it stems from that fact. It, you know, you used to have to uh, cast it, uh, but you don't have to cast it any longer. Okay. So malloc, again, takes in a number of bytes and assigns that to some type of pointer. So let's uh, essentially take this and we'll convert this into using dynamic memory instead of this, which we'll say this is a bad idea, All right? And I will make sure that gets pushed up to GitHub so that you have it uh, for later. But we'll just copy stack and we'll make this dynamic. We'll, well, we'll call this heap.c. So one gets allocated on the stack. This one's going to get uh, allocated on the heap. All right. So let's get rid of this. This is still not a great idea to allow a user to specify how many bytes um, are going to go in, but we'll do it anyway. And we'll call this, um, we'll also do integers, we'll call this int star ptr, just for pointer, um, so that you know that this is a pointer, right? So ptr equals malloc. And we're going to do, we'll do the same thing, A2I, um, and we'll do um, this argv1. So this is the number of bytes that they're going to specify. But understand, uh, this is going into uh, an integer array, essentially, right? Now, in our array, when we put those square brackets and we put a number in there, the compiler knows to take that number, multiply it times the number or the size of an integer, if this is an integer array, and then that's what it actually allocates on the stack. In the case of malloc, um, you're just specifying the number of bytes. So if we know this is going into, you know, uh, a, basically an integer array, we need to also then multiply it by the size of int, right? And it will be perfectly happy to do that. Now, we can't use, just like we did with our array where we did the size of the array to figure out the number of bytes, that doesn't work on the pointer. We're just gonna end up finding, oh, a pointer is eight bytes uh, on my system. So in order to print out um, the actual size, so print F, and we'll do size percent ld just like we did before instead of doing that size of uh the array we'll do um are basically gonna end up having to do this right the number of bytes that we specified so if i um highlight this yank that and hopefully all copied yep all right so we have essentially we're going to print out the number of bytes that we said to allocate um, and it's happy to do so now I'm gonna leave this as is for now just so that we can see some issues and let's do make heap okay so the first thing let's see variable PTR set but not used that's fine it's a warning, uh, unused variable n, so we're definitely not using n anymore. Um, although, 
why don't we go ahead and use that? Because that will probably clean up our program. We'll do n equals, and we'll make this like that. And then that'll be that. And then we'll get rid of this. And that gets rid of that. So now it cleans up these two. So n is going to be the number of bytes we're going to allocate, which is a to i. Uh, that times the size of int, and we should be good. All right. Um, I changed my mind, and I'm gonna do this there. Times size of, and I'm doing this because I want you to see something later. I know this is overkill here, but hey, let's try it again. Okay, so it's just saying, hey, you know, you use, you know, you set pointer, but you didn't use it. That's fine. Let's do heap. So heap should be fine. If I do five, I now have 20. So it's acting just like it did before. Remember how we went up to 30,000 on stack and blew up, or 300, no, 3 million uh, bytes there. Heap is perfectly happy to do so. So it went up to almost 12 megs uh, and it was perfectly happy to do so, right? So allocated roughly 12 megs and then it closed down. Now, um, one thing you may see instead of size of int here, you may see them refer back to the actual pointer. And the reason is, is what happens if I were to change this to a double, but then I forgot every place down here that I had put a size of int. And if I miss one of these, I could allocate the wrong amount of memory or I could think I have a different amount of memory. And so what you'll often see people do is they'll do something like this. Okay, so if we think back to our pointers lesson, we say, okay, the pointer itself is, it refers to uh, an integer somewhere in memory, right? So the pointer itself holds an address. And when we dereference it, we go through that address to somewhere in memory, and that's where the value actually resides. So if we think of what this is doing, we're saying, okay, pointer, you contain a memory address. When I dereference, I follow that memory address and go to where the value actually resides. And now I say the size of that value, well, that value is some type of integer. And so this technically does the exact th same thing as size of int, except that if I were to update this to double, I don't have to change this. If I were to update this to float, I don't have to change this, right? And so by using star PTR instead of int, I can make any change I want to this and I don't have to think about where else I've referenced it and now I have to update this one and that one. So that's one thing you'll see used a lot. And what we can do is remake our heap and it's happy to do so. Um, and I can rerun it and it's happy to do so. Now, so we've allocated memory, we haven't done anything with it, and then we've just returned. And that works just fine. However, there's this thing called free, right? And this is how we release memory um, that we've basically asked for previously, right? So this pointer points to some point on our heap that we've asked to have memory allocated for, but we never asked for it to, you know, be released back to the system. Now, when our program exits, that's that that memory essentially gets handed back to this system. But what if our program didn't exit here. It did a bunch of other things, right? 
and we've basically forgotten about pointer. Well, this essentially now is a memory leak. So every time we make an allocation and then stop using this pointer, our program holds on to that memory as if, you know, we were still going to use it at some point. And so it's customary to free it up when you're done with it, right? So that we give the memory back to the system. This is why, you know, I mean, we've probably all experienced where, you know, we've run something for a long period of time and we wonder why our system is almost out of memory. And it's not till we close some programs and open them back up that all of a sudden we have all this you know, free, you know, uh, you know, memory back in the system. And it's because sometimes people write buggy programs that leak memory. Um, and so over time, they just keep consuming a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more until the point where you're either out of memory or you've rebooted or, or closed the program down, right? So it's a bad idea to do this. Now, how do we figure out if we've got this really long program and we've allocated memory and have we forgotten anywhere where we uh, you know, didn't give it back? Well, there's this cool program called Valgrind that you can essentially run against your program. So if you go val grind, val grind, in this case, because this is a fairly fresh install of Ubuntu, it doesn't have Valgrind. So we'll do a sudo apt install Valgrind. If I could type my password. All right, so it's a not very big program. So we'll download it, install it. I'll arrow back up, Valgrind, and it will tell me right away, hey, uh, in use at exit. So roughly 12,000 bytes, which is what I asked for, uh, was allocated, um, but uh, it, you know, it wasn't free. So typically your program will show at least an allocation, whether or not you used it or not. Um, but what you want to see is, well, I did allocate. It's showing that there's bytes. There was only one free, even though there were two allocations, right? And so we can kind of do some extra checks here. So if we do this leak check full, um, let's try that again. Now it'll tell me, uh, okay, 12,000, uh, 12 million bytes. Uh, in one block are definitely lost uh, in record at blah 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 so some memory address uh, let's see main let's see in my case it's probably because unless I'm just misinterpreting which I don't believe I am might be because I'm not compiling with uh, debug or something like that um, the reason it doesn't tell me where uh, it was allocated, it's just telling me there was memory allocated and you didn't free it. Um, so we can GCC tech G uh, to get debug uh, turned on or debug symbols. Uh, we'll do that. Uh, tech O for this is heap and then heap.c. So we're essentially recompiled it with debug turned on. And let's see. So, okay. So now at this point, it can tell because all of those uh, debug uh, symbols are in there. On line nine of my program, I allocated memory, but did not free it. So I come back to my program and sure enough, line nine, it says, hey, you know, you allocated this, but you never freed it. So let's go ahead and free it. So free PTR. We'll write that, recompile, rerun, and now we have no errors. Uh, no errors are detected. All blocks were freed. No leaks are possible, All right? So this is at least one check that we can do to validate, okay, we allocated, it sees uh, a, an allocation, it sees the free. We know uh, roughly, you know, uh, 12, uh, 12 megs uh, were allocated. 
on the heat, but they were freed and it's running cleanly, right? Now, I've used Valgrin to find memory leaks. I've seen Valgrin detect when I've uh, used a, a pointer incorrectly. I've seen it, you know, indicate when I've used a uh, an array index uh, that was the wrong index value. So maybe the array was only uh, 10 bytes long and now I'm writing into 11, 12, 13 uh, byte positions, right? Um, I've seen it detect those kinds of things. I haven't always seen it detect those kinds of things, but it's definitely useful when you, whenever you start writing programs that are allocating and deallocating memory. Um, I would not write a program um, where I use dynamic memory allocation and I didn't run it through Valgren um, at some point, right? It gets a little bit tricky sometimes when you're doing multi-threading and, and things of that nature. Um, but with these simple ones like this, it's really good at finding those. And so again, I would advise you, once we start using any kind of dynamic allocation, run Valgrind on it, you know. You, you wanna know that you're doing it correctly. Uh, these are just easy wins that you can use uh, in order to um, find those leaks, right? Now, in uh, the markdown file I have here, if we slide down, I've got a couple notes in here. First note is it is important to always check to see if an allocation was successful, right? So if we look uh, under malloc, we can look for returns. So malloc function allocates uh, size bytes and returns a pointer to the allocated memory, right? So essentially, malloc went out on the heap, allocated the number of bytes that we asked for, and it returned the memory address to pointer, to PTR. And then we can do with PTR just like we would with any array or string or, or whatever, right? Um, however, it's not guaranteed to work, right? What if I request more memory uh, than my system has, right? So malloc and calloc functions return a pointer to the allocated memory, which is suitably aligned for any built-in type. On error, these functions return null. Null may also be returned by a successful call to malloc with a size of zero. So essentially, if you call malloc and say, well, I don't actually want any bytes, it's gonna return null. But the big thing to understand is if an error occurs, you should expect a null value to be in that pointer. So what does that mean to us? That means I should be checking for a null value before I try to write to it or anything like that. So what does that look like? Well, it looks just like it did in some of our previous videos. If uh, null equals PTR or PTR equals equals null. Uh, this is my force. This is my habit of putting them backwards so that I don't accidentally make an assignment by forgetting to type in two equal signs. But if uh, null is equal to PTR, f print f, we can send this to standard error and say allocation failed. Right. And we could just return negative one. So we're returning a failure. We're saying, hey, something went wrong. There's no reason to run the rest of the program. Now, we may do something else. We may uh, fail gracefully. In my case, I'm just going to return negative one so that I know my allocation failed. And then, uh, you know, we'll, you know, print out if it was successful, right? So if I write that, if I up arrow to recompile, run Valgrind again, it says everything's great. Um, I'm risking because I'm running in a, VM, in a VM, I'm risking breaking the VM here, um, but it allocated a bunch of bytes. It allocated more bytes. Uh, warning set address, uh, large range. Um, so we're starting to run into some issues. 
and then boom here we see an allocation failed message right and we're seeing you know malik uh, has a fishy possibly negative value so we went so large uh that we potentially um made an integer too large something happened in the background right um and malik failed and so instead of having a hard 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 crash um you know if i wasn't running valgrind on that let's see what would happen so it didn't crash we didn't have a segmentation fault we didn't have anything else we just output hey allocation failed because we requested way more memory than my vm is allowed to have right i'm happy it didn't crash my vm for you guys um but hey malik said hey can't do that sorry not happening um and it returned a null value right now i could have made this a little nicer and just put a carriage return in here and so that would have looked a little nicer but essentially same result um i gotta rebuild um i get an allocation failed message uh and my program exits and so these are things you need to check for because what happens if there's a, a you know a lot of things happening on this machine um, and you're expecting that an allocation worked and then you go to reach into it and use it and all of a sudden uh, because you tried to reach into a null pointer um, you have a segmentation fault so rather than failing uh, gently or handling that failure you have a segmentation fault and your program crashes right so again we're allocating memory this thing could fail to allocate it so we need to validate that it was successful so that's the first thing uh, i wanted to point out uh, when you start allocating memory obviously the big thing was running valgren is good uh, but this one has to be there you just have to do this right or you're going to find uh, at some point um, because your program is fighting against other programs on the system you just anytime you you're working with pointers validate that they have a good value in them before trying to reach it cannot stress that enough and then like we said you should be freeing your memory we should be releasing that right so uh, needs to be freed when it's no longer in use not doing so results in memory leaks right so we don't want that uh, the longer your program runs the more memory it consumes that's that's not good for your users additionally a note that i i put on here um is free does not set a pointer to null and we can validate that so let's do this we'll do print f uh address percent p and we'll do this was our void star because percent v or percent p is expecting a void star pointer uh this is our ptr and this will allow us to print and we can put this in before and after we free so if i recompile and then i'm going to go ahead and run it this time i won't exhaust all my memory notice the address didn't change so we've essentially <clears throat> between these two lines we gave the memory back to the system but we didn't forget where it you know where it was if we make a programming error then at some point and reuse ptr at some point down here we're trying to now use a memory address that we no longer that it no longer belongs to us and this could cause a number of issues um and i think i've noted uh a use after free uh article right so this is on the owasp.org website and so um, this should be down here. So I've skipped a couple of tabs, but essentially it's gonna talk about the use after free memory. 
And so what happens if I try to use that pointer after I freed it? So I've given the memory back, but I've retained the address and then I go and try to use it to either write something to it or read from, from it. So what could happen? Well, um, this could be undefined behavior. It could cause my program to crash. It could cause values to change because maybe that memory now gets allocated to something else, right? Um, but in its worst case, um, it could, you know, either corrupt uh, data or it could allow an attacker to uh, exploit my program, right? So all kinds of weird things could happen. It's a really bad idea, um, you know, to use a pointer after you freed it. So use after or using freed memory, use after free. Um, this is a, uh, I hate to say fairly common error, but this is definitely an error that has led to, you know, vulnerabilities in programs, crashing in programs. Um, so it's happened way too many times, right? And so Valgrind um, should um, catch things like this. Now, I don't know if Valgrind will catch the fact that I'm just reading the address. I don't think it will. Um, if I come back up to Valgrind, slim this down. Okay. So it's not going to complain, but what happens if I were to try to write to it? So let's say star PTR equals five. So I'm gonna to try to write a five at that memory address. Hopefully GCC smart enough. Nope, it's not smart enough. Hopefully Valgren says, hey, you know, you, you tried to write something. Um, and it did. So invalid write of size four. Well, the size of an integer is four. Um, and so where is it saying uh, that that's happening? It's happening on line 16. So we come back, uh, line 16, we freed the pointer and then we tried to write to it on 17. Uh, let's see, okay, it was allocated uh, on 16 and it was written on 17. So Valgrind is letting me know that, hey, you freed this pointer, but then you tried to write to it again, right? And so this is what, you know, is partially meant by use after free. Now I could just be copying data from this. In this case, I'm writing data to it. Um, but that, that memory address no longer belongs to me. And this is what this, uh, using freed memory or use after free is all about. And it can cause, again, corruption of memory, crashing your program, that's probably best case scenario, um, or it opens up a vulnerability in your program that an attacker can exploit, right? So it's really bad to do stuff like that. So instead, um, it's one thing if it's at the very end of your program, so you're essentially freeing it and then returning. Okay, I, I can understand that. If it's not as cut and dry like that, then you should be doing something like this. PTR equals null. So we're saying I'm giving the memory back and then I'm forgetting about the address. Uh, and so you're forcing that to happen. And so now Valgren is perfectly happy. Um, our address is null, nil, right? And so we have forgotten about that memory address. We gave it back and then forced ourselves to forget about it. So now I can't accidentally, you know, try to read from it or write to it. Now, if I try to write to PTR after this line, again, I'm trying to write to a null address. I'm going to have a segmentation fault. But again, that's much better to have your program crash than to silently run and start corrupting memory um, corrupting data or, you know, opening up an area for exploitation, right? So you'd much rather have your program crash than to, you know, like I said, have it destroy memory, destroy data, or, you know, allow an attacker to exploit your system. Okay. So that is use after free. So just make it a habit after you run free, to go ahead and set your pointer to null so that you don't have to worry about it. 
Now, the second one I want to talk about is double free, which is oftentimes just, just as bad, right? It's also a vulnerability, right? So if we come here, uh, I linked in an article called Doubly Freeing Memory. And the reason that this is bad is, again, it can uh, open yourself up to, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, some type of exploitation. It can also potentially open it up to other kind of weird behavior, this and that. Because essentially, there's a structure in the background that keeps track of all of the, the memory that's allocated on the heap. And if you do a double free, you can mess that kind of table up, right? That keeps track of these things, right? And so you can feel free to read down through here. Um, but that's essentially what you're doing is you're, you're causing some cor corruption of that thing. Uh, and so it can't quite track memory like it's supposed to. So what would that look like? Well, that might look like something like, uh, we freed memory, uh, like, uh, we were supposed to, we, um, did it right after we were done using it because we you know knew thinking ahead hey i'm no longer going to use this thing i'm going to go ahead and and free it but then at the very end of our program we decide okay well we before we close out we should be good stewards of memory and we'll go ahead and and free all of our data structures and free you know this and that and we can accidentally free something that we've previously freed now i have done this you know, um, when I'm trying to clean up some some uh, crazy data structure that I've built, um, that you know maybe multiple structs put together in a linked list or some other kind of thing, and each one of those structs contains you know dynamically allocated memory for a string or something along those lines, and I've written some cool function that I just hand it my data structure and it goes through and cleans up all the memory and does something, right? And somewhere in there, I made a programming error and I accidentally freed a string twice. Um, and that can happen. And so it's as easy as freeing a pointer that we've previously freed. And so let's see, does GCC throw a fit? It does not, it allows me to compile it. And so I could run my program and it would probably run just fine. <clears throat> okay, in this case, it actually crashed. Free, double free detected in tcache2 aborted, right? Cool, that's best case scenario right now. My program crashed. Instead of running, thinking everything is great and, um, you know, opening myself up to some type of exploitation. Um, and when I run Valgrind against it, um, let's see, if I read through here, I'll probably see some invalid, invalid free. Um, and so we can start looking back. Okay, there was something on 16 and 17. And I look back. Okay, well, I freed it on 16, and then I tried to free again on 17. <clears throat> so again, luckily, when the program ran, it crashed. And that's best case scenario. Um, instead, what we should do, again, is after we freed it, we've set it to null. And if I look uh, under free, and I'll go to the top of here, and we'll look for free again. Free, free function, frees a memory space pointed to by PTR, which must have been returned by a previous call to malloc, calloc, or realloc. Otherwise, or if free pointer has already been called before, undefined behavior occurs. Again, this is our double free. If PTR is null, no operation is performed, right? So setting this to null could save us from later on Again, we've forgotten that we already freed this memory. We went ahead and compiled it. And when our program runs, it's still happy. It's good to go. Because the pointer was already null at this point. Freeing a null pointer essentially does nothing, right? And so, again, setting this to null 
kind of saves us from shooting ourselves in the foot with this double free. But again, just be good stewards, right? You know you've already freed it, so you don't have to free it again. But I've seen quite a few times where people just do this at the very end of their program. It's just force a habit. But as long as you're doing this, you're safe. Set it to null after you've freed it, and then you don't have to worry about a double free anymore because a free of null does nothing, right? So make this habit. So when you allocate, check for a null. When you free, set it to null, right? So just put those in your toolbox, always do them. Um, and then when you're done, run it in Valgrin just to make sure that you've done everything correctly, All right? So those are big ones. And I, I just wanted to hit that really hard. I know I spent a ton of time talking about it, um, but it's really important as you start you know, doing dynamic memory allocation that you're doing it uh, in a safe manner. Now, we have calic and we have realloc that we have not talked about. So if we look, uh, well, we've got calic up right here. So calic function allocates memory for an array of number of members elements of size bytes, uh, blah, blah, blah. The memory address is set to zero cool so really the difference being malloc oops malloc will allocate a number of bytes and return a pointer to it but it doesn't do anything with what resides at that memory address so just like we saw in our video on arrays you can build an array if you don't initialize it there's garbage sitting there so you can either deal with that or not. Um, if you end up reading from there before you've written anything to it, you're just reading garbage, whatever happened to be at that memory address when it was allocated. The same is true for malloc, right? There's just garbage sitting there. Calic, on the other hand, goes ahead and zeroes out all of those memory addresses, right? And so there are times where you wanna make sure that you're, you're working with a nice, clean area of memory and so calic is is uh nice for that so calling it is very similar to to malloc with the exception of we did a number of bytes times the size of like star ptr right calic does it slightly different where it's the number of members so in our case this would have been the hundred or whatever and then the size would have been size of star PTR, right? So the only difference would have been instead of having this multiplication symbol in here, there's a comma in there and this is calic, right? So calic and then the comma instead of the multiply. And if we rebuild, it runs, we run Valgrin, it runs cleanly. So that's the only difference. It still allocates the memory just like it did before, um, but it goes ahead and it clears the memory, right? Now, we can choose to use calic if we want. There's another, uh, it doesn't have to do with dynamic memory allocation, uh, but there is a memset command that can take some type of pointer some value that you want to write and the number of times you want to write it there. And so we could, uh, instead of doing that calic here, um, we could have done like a uh, memset PTR zero, and we would have done the same thing. N time size, the correction. It just should be just N, right? because it already knows that this is an integer and it's essentially gonna write, right? So in this case, because we have an int, this works just fine. I've used this, if this was a uh, char star, works just fine for those. Um, I don't know if I've used it for much else than that. I have written this across certain structures and so maybe I'll do the size of that struct. Um, we haven't really talked about structs yet, but it's just, it's a way for us to build custom data types. 
but essentially I'm gonna write zeros all across this for the number of times that this thing is specified, right? And so that should work as well. Um, if I recompile, memset requires string.h, and so I could bring in string.h, and that would work. But essentially, it's gonna do the same thing, right? It's gonna allocate the memory, I'm gonna write zeros all the way across it, um, and then go on, right? It's, oops. So instead of doing that, if I knew that all I was gonna do is allocate it and clear it, I might as well call this calloc and put a comma in there. And now it's basically combined into one step. All of that happens in one step now, right? So that's the difference really between malloc um, and calloc is that calloc is going to go ahead and write zeros across it to make sure you end up with nice, pristine memory to use, right? Now, again, it might not be needed in every scenario. Um, it might be a waste of CPU cycles if you don't care about, you know, clearing that entire memory, because maybe I'm allocating way more memory than I may end up using, and so writing zeros across this whole thing might be a waste of CPU power, uh, cycles. That's up to you in, in, in what you wanna do. But essentially, it, they both return a void star pointer that I can now assign to some other pointer and use. I still run free across it just like I did with malloc, right? Now, realloc is a different animal. Uh, it allows me uh, to reallocate memory. And this might be to enlarge memory or this might be to shrink memory, right? And so I could do something essentially like this. If we look at the way that it's used, I have a void star pointer, realloc, I pass in a void star pointer, and I pass in a size. Now, what's with the two void star pointers? So if we go down to realloc, Realloc function changes the size of the memory block pointed to by PTR to size bytes. The contents will be unchanged in the range from the start of the region up to the minimum of the old and new sizes. If the new size is larger than the old size, then the added memory is not or will not be initialized. So it's not going to do like calloc and, you know, clear out memory beyond, right? If PTR is null, then it's equivalent to running malloc. Um, let's see if PTR is not null, then the call is equivalent. Oh, if you set it to zero and PTR is not null, it does the same as free. Um, unless PTR is null, it must be returned by blah, blah, blah. Okay. If the memory, uh, pointed to was moved, a free, uh, is done. So essentially what it's saying is if I ask it to allocate a larger amount of memory, but it had already allocated uh, something else right next to this in memory, well, it might have to move where this uh, uh, allocation is in memory in order to allocate a larger chunk. When it performs that move, it's gonna copy all the data from the original address to the new address, and then it's gonna free the old address and then return to you the new address, right? So it's gonna take care of all that in the background. It'll copy the data to the new place, it'll free the old data, and it'll return to you the new address. So that means what it returns, so if we come back to the top, what it returns here could be the same address as this because it didn't have to, to move it in memory or it could be different. So this was the original address. It couldn't enlarge it where it was currently sitting. So it had to move it. It copied the data across. It freed this address. And then it hands you back this address. So what does that look like for us? That might mean that I need some type of temporary pointer 
that I'm going to use. And so then I could do something like this. We'll keep it like that. We'll put it down here somewhere. And we'll do uh, temp equals realloc. I'm going to send in my original PTR. And I want a new size. And maybe this time I'll have uh, n times 2. So I'm going to double it in size times the size of star PTR. Right? So I'm essentially doubling the amount of memory that I've asked for. Okay? Uh, and I could do, let's do it here. N equals, or times equals two. So I'm doubling the amount of bytes that I'm asking for, All right? So now I need to test. Uh, if null is not equal to, well, I can do it like this. If null is equal to temp, I know something went wrong, right? Um, and I can f print f print f standard error failed to realloc and I can return negative one. Now, what I should probably do in here, if that errored, then I should still free PTR. And then I'm essentially exiting my program right there, right? Otherwise, I'm gonna go ahead and PTR equals temp. Now, if everything worked right, and it didn't have to move this address. That means these two are equal. So this will essentially do nothing, right? It's copying the same address into PTR. So it's essentially doing nothing. But if it had to move this, so wherever this existed in memory, I'm asking for twice the amount of memory now, it couldn't put it in the exact same spot because there's something next to it. So it allocated new memory for it, copied all the old data out, freed this pointer, and returned temp. Now I'm saying this new address I'm going to assign to PTR. So whenever I use PTR down here, I'm talking about the newly allocated memory. And in the case that it fails, I indicate a failure, I free the original pointer, and I return, right? And so let's see if that compiles. If I haven't mistyped anything, it does compile and it runs. And so I initially uh, asked for, let's see, one, two, three, one, two, three. I asked for 12 megs, essentially, roundabout. But notice here, 36 megs was actually allocated. So we had. 12 and then it allocated essentially 24 more and so I end up with roughly 36 you know megs got allocated but notice everything freed nicely and I have no leaks right and we could probably uh, continue to go up and see what happens and at some point I'm sure it will throw you know a fit so now I went to 360 megs um, you know, even though it started at 120 and we could continue to go up and I'm sure at some point it will fail. Maybe even will break my program. So this realloc is taking forever. Um, so we're definitely having some problems here, but it, it, it worked. I mean, I'm looking at almost three gigs of memory, you know, got allocated. If I do it outside of Valgren, Valgren, you know, because it's having to check everything, it slows the process down quite a bit. Um, at some point, either the malloc is going to fail. So the malloc failed in that point. Uh, I'm sure I could probably get to something here where the malloc works, but the realloc does not work. Um, I'm at like, I don't know, 2.4 gigs. Either way, 
the point is is that um, we can reallocate we can grow it we can shrink it um, but because of the way it works and the way it may have to copy memory over we still need to check for our null values but then we need to copy you know into our original pointer to ensure that if it had to move the data to a another point in memory um, you know we don't lose track of that right okay so I am way over time um, at least an hour over an hour into this video uh, and that is crazy but I hope you have gotten more than your fair share uh, a taste of dynamically allocating memory because we're definitely going to see it used more and more malloc going to allocate a number of bytes calloc going to allocate that number of bytes but it's also going to clear it realloc is going to allow us to either grow or shrink that memory free is going to release that memory back to the system um and then i'll put a note because I don't think I noted Valgrind in this markdown document, but I'll definitely put a note for Valgrind in there uh, and how important it is before pushing it to GitHub. Um, when we're using our free, we need to be aware that there is a use after free and a double free. And the way that we fix that is by ensuring that once we free, go ahead and set our pointer to null so that we don't accidentally use it after we freed it and we don't try to free it a second time, um, you know, and, you know, hurt ourselves again. So hope this was helpful. I apologize that it's gone so long. Nobody in their right mind will be listening at this point. Um, so I can pretty much say anything I want, uh, but I'll just say goodbye.